Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. I do want to encourage you, if you've not already, to pick up my book, Slime Incorporated. It's my first ever detective novel. It's a story of murder and dirty politics set against the backdrop of the Idaho gubernatorial election as private investigator Cole Eustick tries to navigate this world. Uh, the book is available as a paperback, as an ebook, as well as an audiobook through audible.com or the iTunes store. And you can find all my books, audiobooks, and ebooks at store.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for today's episode of It's a Crime, Mr. Collins, the original air date, July the 29th, 1957. And this one is The Bullet Gray Cottage. <laughs> It's a crime, Mr. Collins. It surely is. After all, I always thought the stars in the evening sky were very romantic. But you wouldn't think you would look at them and predict a murder. Now, would you? Yes, this is Gail Collins talking. And I'll be back in a minute to set the stage for our puzzling crime. <laughs> It's a crime, Mr. Collins. This is a story about an astrologer, is it, Gail? No, Jack, it's a story about an economist. Well, some of them are stargazers, too, aren't they? You said it, Jack. I didn't. Well, let's have the story. It began with an invitation to visit Professor Crank, one of the world's foremost economists and experts on international exchange. The professor had heard that my husband, Greg Collins, was a darn good detective. He sent Greg an urgent message to come to the university, where he spent most of his time in the research lab. The invitation was odd, because the professor had the reputation of being a hermit. He never sought publicity. Very few people had ever met his immediate colleagues. He refused all press interviews. Greg and I drove across the Bay Bridge to a quiet, secluded section outside our home in San Francisco. We met the professor in his study. Mr. Collins, I have been invited to the late Louise conference. Yeah, I read about it, Professor. Industrialists from Europe and South America meeting in private at executive session. That is correct. They are going to make certain decisions which will affect the economics of every Western nation, especially their currency. I want you to come to Lake Louise with me. Me, Professor? What for? I go by what the stars tell me, Mr. Collins. I have studied ancient folklore extensively. You know, the early scientists placed a great deal of faith in reading the future from the stars. Whenever I follow them, I am well and successful. When I do not, there is danger and disaster. Oh, <laughs> I know you think the old codger is just foolish, a superstitious man. But the stars have never been wrong for me, Mr. Collins. Well, can you uh, tell me an example of what you mean? Yes. My secretary, Herbert Sands. He acted as secretary and bodyguard for me. Ordinarily, he would have taken this trip with me. What's wrong, Professor? Herbert has disappeared completely. The night after he vanished... I foresaw an evil omen in the sky. Then you want Greg as a bodyguard? Precisely. Frankly, Professor, I'm not a bodyguard. I'm a private detective. <laughs> Nevertheless, if some sort of trouble develops, I would find your services most valuable, would I not? You certainly would. There is danger in this conference at Lake Louise. What? These decisions will affect stocks, bonds, monetary standards. We were planning a vacation, and now you... Oh, by all means, take your wife with you. I'd be delighted. Let's do it, Greg. 
They say Lake Louise is one of the most beautiful spots in the world. You have got to come with me. I must not make this trip alone. We'll go, Professor. Oh, good. A private plane has been chartered for me. Hangar 6. At 5 a.m. tomorrow morning. <laughs> to avoid reporters as the public... Have you uh, any reason other than the stars to believe you're in personal danger? Any enemies uh, in some personal trouble? No. But the stars would not deceive me. Something ominous is in the air about my going to Lake Louise. Not to be more specific? I mean, death, Mr. Collins. Violent death. <laughs> After we left the professor, I went around singing about the breeze on Lake Louise. Greg grumbled about being a nursemaid to a neurotic professor. But the fee covered our vacation expenses, and that made the whole deal more pleasant. I showed Greg a few travel folders showing the midnight scene on the lake. So Greg came around slowly, as usual, to liken the idea. At 5 a.m., we found Hangar 6. The airport was deserted. As they reached the door of the plane, a rather short, stocky man with heavy glasses met Yes. What can I do for you? Is Professor Krantz on the plane? Sorry, you can't see him. No reporter. Oh, we're not reporters. We're going with him. No one is going with him. Oh, look, he gave me his card. He said if we had any trouble, we should show it. Uh, hey, would you take it to him? If he sees the card, he'll okay out getting aboard the plane. Wait here, please. I'll ask him. Great. The poor old man is so frightened. He's surrounded himself with all sorts of guards and rigmarole. Mm-hmm. What are you thinking? Nothing. I know you, chum. Well, I, I, I don't like the atmosphere around here. That's all. Something screwy. You're a weird old duck. But cute, I think. Like a little boy who believes in bogeyman. Well, this Lake Louise better be good. I don't enjoy the prospect of soothing the old man's brow while he looks around for Gremlin. Oh, there's a man again. He'll probably go in now. The professor's changed his mind. He says forget it. What? Well, he was very anxious for us to go yesterday. Maybe, but now he's changed his mind. Here. He said he's a hundred dollars for your trouble. But he was so upset yesterday. He insisted. Sorry. Now, if you don't mind, we'll be taking off. But I was planning to go to Lake Louise. Well, it's just as well, Gail. Uh, uh, thank the professor for us. I certainly will. But, Greg... Come on, Gail. Let's walk back to the entrance gate. Bye. Bye. Greg Collins, you treat this as though it were nothing. Why not? Maybe his secretary, Herbert Sands, came back. Maybe he got another guy for my job. Not none of my business. Yeah, I'll take it to Lake Louise some other time. And this time, we'll head for Big Bear Lake. Uh, look for a phone booth, Gail. I want to call a client today. I'm staying in town. But you said you suspected something. Ah, uh, just a gloomy morning, that's all. Ah, uh, here's a booth. Wait here. The door. You want to fix these doors in these phone booths? They jam so often. Ah. Uh, uh. Oh, gosh. Now, if I have... Greg! Look! In the booth! That's it. Don't make fun. Nancy? He isn't dead, is he? Yeah. Yes. Uh oh. I've got no action. He'll just sit on the back of the head. Can you find out who he is? Wait, I'll have a look at him. Yes. Lake Louise section. See, Greg, I told you that... Let's see if there's invitation business. Jim, that's kind of deep. That's sighted. Come on, Gail. Oh, where to? That plane, hurry. Where are we going? What? The hangar. we got to get on that plane. That man must have fired the professor to Lake Louise. Don't you see that? Run past it. Hey, cut it off the plane. Hurry. Uh, this door, we got to get it open before she picks off. You'll never do it, girl. Uh, I, I got it. Uh, jump in, come on, jump in. Oh, oh we made it. Uh, why, 
a surprise. I thought you two went home. Well, the professor changed his mind, so we changed ours, too. We're so anxious to see Lake Louise. What happened back there, Ned? Our two friends decided to come along. Oh, where's the professor? The cabin, in fact. Well, uh, if you two were coming along, you'd better get acquainted. Uh, my name's Collins. Uh, this is my wife, Kate. Mine's Ned Ferry. Are we flying directly to Lake Louise? Yeah. Next to Boone Pilot. Are you newspaper people? No, uh, we're going to read a report at the conference. Uh, uh, can I talk to the professor? No, he don't want to read it, Well, I'm sure I'd like to talk to me. You heard him, Colin. Sit up. Nick may be a hot rock pilot, but he's not very polite, is he? Well, that's rather surprising. Most of the regular pilots are uh, courteous. Uh, are you part of the professor's entourage, Ned? I, um, I'm not a delegate, no. I'm just going along with I'd like to see him. Uh, maybe if I just stuck my head in the door. I'm not going to see it again. The professor is to be left alone. Get away from that cabin door, Carl. You don't hear well, do you? Professor Kranz, you in there? Yes. Who is it? Uh, Greg Collins. How are you? Oh, just fine. Please pull up your shirt. All right, Professor. You're an eager beat, right, Colin? Sometimes. Just try to control it. You could be all wrong, you know. Everything might be just fine. There might be no reason at all to be absent. None at all. But we knew something was wrong. And we were determined to get to the bottom of it. Keep your ears pinned, then. We'll be back in a minute with more of our story. For hours, Greg and I fenced with Ned. We weren't sure what was up. Greg kept trying to get clues about the nervous pilot in the phone booth. But Ned seemed perfectly innocent. Couldn't he be just a tough bodyguard or what? He kept making believe about going to the conference to read a paper. And we landed at the airport and began taxiing down the runway. Look at that, Lake Louise Airport. Let's go. You ready, Gail? Yeah, surely. Nice to have known you, Ned. Congratulations, Tom. For what? Keeping up the end. What? It's a bit about being dark. You haven't anything to do with the conference. You're probably thinking. And you aren't going anywhere, you know. That's it, you know. Maybe. I think so. I see a pickpocket car. Want to see one of your own calling fans? I got it off you as soon as you got on the plane. Congratulations, Ned. You helped yourself with that gun I bought to protect the professor, too. Yeah. Now I'm going to do all the talking. When we get off the plane, we'll see nothing to anybody. You get into a car with us and keep your traps closed. Otherwise, the life of yours will get a pretty little head blown. Understand? Go on. Just walk to the car. Be quiet. If anybody asks you anything, don't ask. I'll do the talk. What well, he says, Gary. I'm all alone down. Just remember what Peter said, Gary. I'll teach you how to get real angry. <laughs> Ned and I sat in back of the car. Nick was at the wheel. They were too smart to let either of us sit with the driver. Ned had the gun out in the open now, ready to use it at any second. No one else got out of the plane. The car tore across the Canadian countryside towards Lake Louise. All right to talk now, teacher? Never mind the gags, Collins, or just for laughs. I'll plant one on your ugly foot. He is trying to see. That goes to you, too, Gail. Want to hear a story, Ned? I don't want to hear anything. This one's all about how a gang of hoods kidnapped Professor Clint. Maybe knocked him out. And substituted a pony for him, an active. That's an old story. Let's hear a new one. 
Very few people know what Clance looked like. He lived ten miles from nowhere. His name is known, not his face. Never appeared in print. Just a handful of people back in San Francisco know him by sight. A pushover. No? Good way to get your own man into the Lake Louise conference. <laughs> You're a crummy detective. I know 60-year-old kids could have figured all that out. Uh, maybe you like the end of the story better. I'm working on it now. I... It... Cut it out, Gail. Cut what out? I saw you in the mirror. Making that play for Nick. Play up. Oh. Shut up, Craig. Makes a play for every guy we meet. He ain't doing nothing, Colin. I can't even look at another man without this husband of mine burning up. What's wrong with the girl looking at somebody? Not the way you're looking, Chimp. Want to sit up front with me, Mrs. Collin? You can call me Gail, Nick. Nobody goes up front with Nick. Oh, we just talk a little, man. Shut up and drive. No love life can wait till this job's over. Don't worry. This man Collins won't be on anybody's list much longer. I picked up the suit and grade to make a play for Nick, and I kept on doing the best I could. By the time we pulled up to a small gray cottage hidden in a clump of trees, I'd almost convinced myself I had a yen for Nick. We went into the living room of the empty cottage, and I saw why Greg had thought of the trip. They tied him to a chair that left me free. Ned disappeared. We gotta stay here with your husband, Gailey. But why, Ned? I gotta keep an eye on him. Ned's orders. Look around, honey. See if you can find a radio. Maybe we can hear a little rock and roll. Here's one. Sam? Sure. There still isn't much of a party. I'm warning you, Nick. You won't be happy till you buy a less big Maybe I will, pal. Anything around here to eat or drink? Oh, well, might be something in this cabinet. Yeah. Yeah, here's a bottle. Pour me a drink. Okay, sweetheart. Hmm. He has to ask me. You bet, honey. Here's to forgetting about him in that corner there. Come on, Nick. Okay, baby. Let's go. I kept working on this, still not sure what Greg had in mind. After about 20 minutes, Nick had had some drinks. He was feeling very talkative. Well, you get rid of that loud gale, and I'll take care of you. You talk a very fancy ball game, but uh, how are you going to do it? Is deal going to pay off well? You see, pal, already with the banquet. Why? Things are all like that. And how about it, Nick? You stand and make no? Yeah, sure. What did you do with the weevil, said the friend, Nick? We send him on a Girl Scout picnic. Try again, Colin. I ain't that stupid. Come on, Nick, don't pay attention to him. Hey, there's no more cigarettes, no more liquor. Oh, wait here. I'll go find some of How am I going, Greg? A little too well. And get this paper from my hands and put it into this bottle where I can reach it fast. It's just maybe five seconds. Ah, uh, Hurry! Here, here it comes. Cigarette. And I found some beer in the refrigerator. Nothing's mm-hmm. stopping our little party, huh? Ah, uh, how's for another dance? No, huh? okay. You're a very good dancer. Oh, I got all kinds of talent. You know the new step they do with the circling around? Oh? Well, I'll show you. Now watch me. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Can you do it? Uh, try it once more. Uh, show me. Okay. One, Here two, three, four. Oh. Good. Naturally. He didn't just tap him with that liqueur bottle. He tripped over the cord to the radio, too. I'll take back my gun. Now, now what? Nick isn't alone here. I have to keep anybody else's around. How? 
I'll duck behind this door. You scream. I what? Scream right now. Seem like you were being murdered. Hello, Matt. I guess I'll find that out of the way. Let's look for a phone. I've got to call the conference. Well, I don't see a phone. Neither do I. I found it, but keep your eyes open. I wouldn't be surprised if the real Professor Clance was here somewhere. Maybe they've killed him. I'm not sure. You've got to see if he's around here. It's car upstairs. There's a slide. He's coming too. Better make it very fast. Try these rooms. Open all the doors. Here. Well, this room's empty. Oh, Craig, why don't we go to this big conference and tell them what's happened? Why waste time looking for the professor? They'll never believe us. We've got to have the real man. They'll think we're crazy or we're playing a trick. Gary, it's me. In here, on the top. I've seen him. He's ill. No. Let me see that. Doug, Gail, we've got to bring him too. I'll stop his face, that'll help. Professor Crant. Professor Crant. Sit up, Professor. Can you sit up? I am so weak. Keep an eye on the two guys downstairs, Gail. Tell me if they come too. Tell right, Crant. You were dope, Professor. So you wouldn't know where you were being taken or who took you there. Now, try to get a hold of yourself. Recognize me? Recognize me now? Yes. Mr. Mr. Collins. Come on. We're going to try and make it to the conference. We have a man that sneaked in there. We've got to stop him. Now, lean on me. Stand up, come on. That's it. Come on. All right, to come out, Gail? Yes, but hurry. See the car outside? Yes. Let's see if we can make it. Stay right where you are, folks. I'll be back in a minute to bring you the time. Okay. We got the professor downstairs and into the car and ripped away down the highway. We must make it on time, Mr. Collins. The consequences of an unscrupulous group of men having access to advanced information could be enormous. Turn on the radio, Gail. It could be a serious blow to the rest of nation. Got it. Look for news. They may be covering the conference. You can feel that way if it's too late. Nothing doing yet. From the auditorium, the delegates will be gathering. Got it. We are not allowed to give you radio coverage of this Lake Louise conference because the information and decisions made there will be very secret. Drive faster, Greg. Faster. I got it on the phone now. Oh, there's only a motor cop that spot us. I only see you when you still want them to. He could clear the way for us. Professor Stiles of Harvard, Professor de Santigny of Belgium, the British Treasury Advisor, Sir John McDowell. I don't recognize this next gentleman. Yes, it's Professor Kratz, the economist for the San Francisco. That's your impersonator, Professor. He's at the meeting. How long will be before any secret material is discussed? Very little time. Roll call, then they begin. Urgent international money matter. Come on, Greg, come on! There it is, Greg. The main driveway to the conference building. See the sign? Right. Come on, Professor. Follow me. Go ahead, Mr. Collins. The attendants. They'll stop you, Greg. I hardly think so, Gail. Out of my way, please. Uh, I see the doorway once. I'll... Did you duck under those velvet ropes, Professor? Good. That's it. Here we are. Gentlemen, may I interrupt? Someone in this room is masquerading as Professor Ephraim Cranch. In order to have access to the information being discussed here. Mr. Collins, look. The man on the platform. The speaker. Herbert Sam, my secretary. Get off that platform, Sam. The window. He's going out the window. To the balcony. (laughs) 
Greg fired at the imposter and winged him in the shoulder. The meeting eventually calmed down. The real professor took his proper place. And Greg and I left the conference room. Come on, Gail. We've had it. But, Greg, we're supposed to be on a vacation. This is gorgeous country. You aren't going back to San Francisco now, are you? Oh, no. What was it you were telling me about moonlight sailing on a Canadian lake? Greg and I did go for moonlight sailing. If you've ever competed with a sailboat for a man's attention, you must know how difficult it is. But I won. Don't go away. In just a moment, we'll be back with you. Well, folks, Kate and I hope you enjoyed our adventure in the Bullet Gray Cottage. Be sure to visit us next time for another puzzle in murder. Whether it's crime and romance, there you'll find Mr. And Mrs. Hum. Welcome back. Well, my favorite episode of this series so far. A clever premise, and then you have some really suspenseful uh, scenes. And a nice uh, Cold War uh, backdrop to it really does make it work. So, yeah, I, I really quite enjoyed this episode. I do want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you so much to Becky. Becky's been one of our Patreon supporters since March of 2019. And she's currently supporting us at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Becky. And that will actually do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Rocky Jordan next Tuesday. Another episode of It's a Crime, Mr. Collins. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.